What's up, everybody? Uh, looks like I'm a minute late today because I tried to go on live, but turns out I started a show in the offline mode. So, yeah, that doesn't work. Now, uh, today we're going to be talking about the cars that I personally like to buy and sell, and I'm going to give you some insight on why and um, and maybe how that might affect you in your particular region. May or may not affect you. I mean, you don't have to listen at all, but I'm just giving you some insight on why I do it. Uh, so this actually comes from a guy. He's actually, I think he said he was in Cincinnati. So Cincinnati is not really all that far from us. It's probably about five or six hours. I'm just guessing. I'm thinking Ohio's, Pennsylvania, Ohio. It's not that far. Um, but it's a different market completely than our market. So he, he keeps saying he gets the wrong cars. They take too long to sell. He can't flip them. It's just taking too long. It's too long. It's too long. And it's aggravating the crap out of him. So my so I'm going to tell him why I do it, and maybe this will help you. And his name, actually, I'm not able to say his name. So we're just going to leave that off. because I can say his name, but I might get blocked on YouTube. Um, <laughs> by the way, these handles you guys come up with are hilarious. Um, okay, so the reason or what – so let's talk about your market. So the market that I'm in – I'm in between Richmond, uh, Charlottesville, uh, Fredericksburg, Washington, D.C., right on the 95 corridor. So on the 95 corridor, the main thing that you got a lot of people doing is traveling. There's a lot of there's a lot of road miles put on cars. So people around here tend to look for cars if they're going to be in the cheaper car range. They tend to look for cars just to throw miles on. So. All right, let's talk about the cars that I like then. So immediately, I'm going to like subcompacts. But all subcompacts are not created equal. There's some subcompacts that just aren't worth meth mething. Yeah, nothing's worth mething with. Let's just go ahead and leave mething out of this. Um, hey, what's up, guys? What's up? What's up? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, everybody's present. You know, one day we're going to have a bunch of people on here. I mean, I get thousands and tens of thousands of views daily, but I don't advertise this. So this is like people only see this in rotation unless you're one of the guys that know that it comes on at five o'clock. Um, so, yeah, everybody is present. We should have like five or ten people, and I think it keeps it pretty cool keeping a small crowd. All right. So where was that? I was talking about the cars. That, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm saying all cars are not created equal. And I mean that. So. I would pick a Chevy Cavalier over a BMW to flip. I would pick a uh, Toyota Corolla over a uh, Subaru Outback. I, I take that back. I'm kind of okay with Subarus. They get a little fun wonky, but I'm okay with them. Um, but the cars that I don't like, I, I would pick a four-cylinder over a V8 gas um, GM Cadillac any day. This is for my market. If I The bigger the car is, the longer it takes to sell it. And the bigger the name brand is, the faster it does sell. So if I had a small Toyota, it's going to fly off the shelf. If I've got a, fly, a small Nissan, it's going to go pretty fast too. Not as fast as a Toyota, but it's going to rock and roll. If you can get like a Lexus at any size, it doesn't matter because Lexus are just loved. Um, yeah, an 06 Beetle, that's another great car. People like the Beetles. Um, and, you know, Audis... Even though they got a bad name, Audis, they got almost too much stuff on them. Even though I know you're going to say, well, that's the same car as a Beetle. Technically, a lot of the drivetrain stuff, but they add so much extra crap to the Audis that when you get into vehicles with over 100,000 miles, it gets a little scary. Um, so my favorite car right off the bat, I can tell you if I could buy them by the truckload and just load them out here and have 30 of them delivered. I would have 30 RAV4s delivered out here tomorrow, and we would sell every RAV4 by tomorrow night. Like, it's that ridiculous. A RAV4 is a screaming hot SUV. It's a Toyota. It's a four-cylinder. Um, people love them. They're durable. Mileage don't scare them. You can buy them reasonably cheap, and you can flip them super fast. So that's, like, going to be one of my all-time favorite picks. If I was going to look like <laughs> BW's in disguise, yes, it is. Um so if I was going to wrap my favorite car, I'd have to go with an SUV and say something like a RAV4. Now, me personally, I wouldn't drive the thing anywhere. I don't like them. But liking them to sell is a completely different story. Um, that's not true. I actually did kind of enjoy it when I get them. I do drive them around. Um, 
Hard as ever to work on, though. Yeah, he's probably talking about the Volkswagen or the Audis. So, yeah, those, let's talk about Volkswagen Beetles. Beetles are super cheap. Like, not an 06. 06 can cost you some money. But I'm talking about if you went to, like, a 99, the new Beetle, 2000 new Beetle. Those things are like, if you if you go to replace the radiator, and I did a video on this. If you go to replace a radiator in one of those guys, the whole front clip is coming off. The entire front clip. It's got to come off for you to access the radiator. I mean, it is a hoss of a job. Now, it's not complicated. It does take half the day, but it can be done. But you take that in consideration and you look like a, like a little uh, Corolla. You can flip a Corolla uh, as far as maintenance. You can just flip it in and out in an hour. I mean, you don't take long for a radiator or anything on that car. Yeah, exactly. No rabbies. I hear you. Take the front off. I hear you. Um, so yeah, so my, my first one I would have to say would be the, the RAV4. I would, if you've got a good running beetle, beetles are good because they're inexpensive in one area because of cost, but there's other things on them that are extremely expensive. And the other design flaw they had in the earlier ones, they didn't even have temperature gauges. They just had lights, which I really had a problem with. You don't know if you're buying an overheating car or not, unless you have a scanner. So that that's another thing too that people are really apprehensive about, and they seem to have they seem to be plagued with a lot of little problems that just cost out the butt to fix. All right, so my first one's going to be the Toyota Rav Four. My second one is going to have to be the Toyota Corolla. Those things, every time I get one, it's just like uh, it's just like giving crack to a crackhead. I mean, they just love them. They everybody loves the Toyota Corolla. They know they can drive the crap out of it. They know it's going to last forever. And no matter what it needs, if it needs a set of coils or 25 bucks a piece, you know, tires are cheap. Everything on the car is cheap, 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 which is awesome. I mean, and that's the kind of car you're looking for. Another one mass produced on the same line is the Toyota Camry, which I've had several of. Those things are great. I mean, you can just, you can, the little four cylinders in them, even though they had that factory recall where they replaced their, the engines on them, but assume you got one that's fixed. Anything on that car is easy to do from the timing belt to the, the, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what that stupid thing needs. Even pulling the head is no big deal. Like though a Camry is a super easy car to work on, which means it's fast and cheap to come in and out. People already got the name recognition and they want them. It's a desirable car. So that would be my three right there. As far as Nissans go, I get real leery of Nissans, and I'll tell you why. Any little thing you do with a Nissan pops the computer. And I mean anything, like a bad IAC. I've seen IACs. I can't even tell you how many Nissans I've had to deal with that the IAC has fried the computer in. That's the idle air controller. And when you um, when you get into the – when you get into like the uh, – into the bigger scale of things like uh, maintenance. Maintenance is a deal. So if you buy these cars with a miss, like the Nissans, I had a Pathfinder in the other day. What a pain in that butt. I mean, it's like it runs, it almost runs perfect. It almost runs perfect. It just won't idle right. And then it comes out and that's what it is. The IAC is fried part of the computer. You know, I'm down 800 bucks by the time it's all said and done, which is ridiculous because now I've got, um, I'm probably in this car probably at least a thousand dollars too heavy. Sure, I'll make some money when it sells, but at the end of the day, it's just a waste of time. So I like Nissans with caution. Are they running and are they running good? And like the Nissan Altimas and the Maximas, they're great cars, but heed my warnings. If you ever get into the crank scissor scissor, crank scissor issue, I don't think that's actually a word. The crank sensor issues, there's three of them. And if you've got one that they're like, oh, it just needs a crank sensor. Well, that's kind of BS. It could need a crank sensor. Um, it, it, it's just, it's a very complex car. It's not that simple to put back together. Now, they are great cars when they're running, however. Um, but long story short, it, it can you can be a truckload of money into it, getting it ready. Um, early Maximus, yeah, they were really nice. Some catch up with you guys. Um Okay, take the front off. You have E6, Helena was my wife. Okay, like some Sunfires and Cavaliers, uh, I-30, I-35. Yeah, so let's just look at a Maxima. You're going to have a, a, a – people love Maximus. They do love them. I'm not telling you not to buy them. Um, yeah, Cordez, we'll catch you on the flip. 
But I'm just telling you, buy them with caution. You want one that's running because if you don't get one that's running, it can just really be a money pit. And that gets, once again, back to Nissans and how sensitive they are with computers. I mean, you might think you have a crank sensor and then have a blown ECM. But, man, they sell super fast. So I guess if you could get it for nothing and you've got the time, you're not going to lose on it other than the amount of time it's going to take to get a Nissan going. But a running Nissan is a great Nissan. So, all right. So let's talk about another SUV that's a personal favorite of mine, the Jeep Liberty. Now, everybody knows on the Internet, I have the biggest videos on how to rebuild the three sevens and four seven engines. I did a complete series on it. So the three seven and the four seven have a fatal flaw. The number one cylinder tends to drop a valve seal and the rocker arm falls off. I know it's crazy, but it happens. And so you'll get these cars that almost once again sound like they run good, but they've got that huge miss. Blah, 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 blah. And that really is pulling the head and just replacing the head, which, you know, once again, if you've got the time and the money and the you can make a ton of money on a Jeep Liberty because a women love Jeep Liberties. Let me get that in your head. Women love Jeep Liberties. I've never had a Jeep Liberty for sale more than 24 hours. They sell. They sell like lightning. They're like hotcakes. You cannot you cannot outdo the value of a Jeep Liberty and its desirability. Um, so a Jeep Liberty is awesome. Now the four sevens also have, this is where you can really make some money on them. If you get the four seven or the three seven and it's got a timing issue up front where it's rattling real bad, that scares the living crap out of everybody that's trying to buy those cars. But let me tell you what, that is a very simple timing job. And you can get in that thing for maybe 150, 200 bucks. It, that'd be the uh, it's a three chain job with the tensioners and the guides. You can get that car and you can bring it in and you can do it in probably six hours or less. I'm saying do it yourself. You don't even need a mechanic. Okay, you might need a little bit of mechanical. You with my video, you could do it yourself in six hours. I promise you. You get into that car. And man, you got like, I bought a, um, what was it? A 07 Jeep Grand Cherokee the other day. I say the other day, about a month ago. And same thing. It only had 104,000 miles on it. And it had less miles than that. That's what the clock had on it. They had to replace the engine. The engine they replaced, it rattled, man. I mean, growl. I mean, as soon as you just hit the gas. And if you didn't know any better, you'd almost think the piston was hitting. But I knew, I knew exactly what it was. I put a stethoscope on it, listened to it. I knew where it was at. So I bought this car. I think it was a 07. And I think I gave the guy 550. I think I did pay the guy 550 bucks, four wheel drive, 100,000 miles. And six hours later, put brand new timing chains on it, brand new guides, hit the key. Boom. She's ready to go. Oh, and I put a cam sensor in it because the chain slashing had just knocked the cam sensor through a loop. But forget all that. That's a car that once you got the education on, that there is a market out there. This is across the country because this is something that's fatally wrong with all these Jeeps. So you, once you learn how to do that job, you can always make yourself three grand on the car on the flip because it's, you know it's a six-hour job. It's a $250 repair, and we know that we can get the car in, bring it, and flip it and sell it in less than you know two or three days, and you're going to make yourself three or four grand because the 07 Jeep, I can't remember what I sold it for. I think I sold it for close to five grand. Somewhere around there, but I only had five hundred dollars in it. So, I, well, plus the parts repair, and that's just something I do all year round. Like I, I don't find them every day, but often enough, I find a three seven in a Grand Cherokee or a four seven that's got a timing rattle. I go buy it for five or six hundred bucks and sell it for three to five thousand. Period. Same thing with Jeep Liberties. When I find them and they've got a knock, I'm like, no problem. Or I'm sorry, if they've got a miss, not a knock. If they've got the miss or the timing rattle. Same thing. I know I'm going to make three grand, you know, five, six hours into it. Do it, do it, do it. So Grand Cherokees and Jeep Liberties are screaming hot. People love them, but they don't want to work on them. So if you've got the ability to fix them, they're great, great, great cars. Um, yeah, that is good Jeep info because you can always make money on Jeeps if you know how to buy Jeeps. Uh, okay. So what do you make of the Prius even with high miles? Okay. So Prius, I'm gonna tell you a little story about Prius. So, um, those cars, they have their own dedicated buyer. You never got to be scared of a Prius because someone will always come and buy them, even though they're cheap, but when they're used, um, 
two more parts. <laughs> oh, okay, got you, got you. I hear you, yeah. So um, that's right, keep a spare car in the back, spare Jeep. So Prius is a great car. It's a great subcompact. People love them. The gas mileage, you know, no, no apologies there. Um, the reliability, nobody's there, even the hybrids with the batteries and all that. You can get the batteries rebuilt on those things. Um, am I thinking right? Yeah, I think it is. I don't mess with them that much, but a buddy of mine, that's all he does. And I think he rebuilds the battery for about 700 bucks. He takes them apart, switches the, he orders the cartridge and puts them himself and he's done with it in like five or six hours. I mean, that is a big job, but he does it. He's so used to doing it. It's just normal. Um, I think that was with Hondas. The, the, I can't remember which Honda that does that. Maybe it is a Civic. Maybe they have a electric. See, I steer away from them. That's why I don't know them that well. But I know that a lot of people do pay attention to the uh, the battery-powered stuff. And that really is where things are going. Not for us immediately, but that's the future. That's where it's heading, so you might as well get used to it. Um, so the Hyundai Genesis is a great car. Hyundai itself... They really put out crap. They didn't put out crap. What they did is they bought into a buy here, pay here market when they entered our country um, in the retail market in the car arena. So they really put the cheapest of everything out there that they could to get market. But they're really a high tech company. So they've over the last 10 years or so, they've really upped their game. And they're I mean, honestly, they're just as good as any other out there. I mean, they're getting primary buyers. That's a plus credit rating customers coming in and buying them the same customers that are, they're competing with the uh, late model um, all the big three and all the big imports so there's nothing wrong with Hyundai that is a good the Genesis is a nice car and it is uh, it is definitely a, a good um, it's definitely a good car so and I'll and let me talk about Hyundai's in general except for the original ones which they came in and they were really rough like the accents and all that stuff and y'all know which ones I'm talking about Still a decent little engine in them, but I mean, they were weak in the transmission. All the parts were kind of subferior. But over the last seven, eight, ten years, Hyundai has really upped their game. Don't be afraid to jump into a, you know, 05 newer plus, 05, 07 Hyundai. Jump in it, steal as cheap as you can, and flip it because they're great cars and they take a beating. I mean, they rock and roll with no problem. Um, so another... Uh, Let's talk about, okay, so we got Hyundai we just talked about, and, I, and I'm and i endorsing Hyundai. And let me tell you another car that stepped up their game, which Kia, we all know Kia. And we, the first thing that comes to mind is Kia Sophia or Kia Rio, which as far as I'm concerned, there's two Kias. There's a $500 one um, and then the $800 one. One's new and one's a year old. That's the only Kias that I know. But, and that's just how I grew up. I mean, Kias are just worth nothing. And Kia Rios are, you know, two or three hundred dollar car if you can buy it. And if you can sell it, you'll get two or three hundred dollars for it. I, that's just how I see them. Now, I know there's probably a few hundred bucks there, but Kia and a whole like the Kia Spectra, that whole uh, generation, the Kia Rios, some older ones, they're just they're just piles. But move it forward. Once again, just like Hyundai did, these Korean cars, they up their game, too. So they have a crappy reputation, and this gives a little bit of a market stretch for you because they seeded all their stuff low and bad to start with because they were coming under market, and now we've turned around. They've turned their game up, and now they're competing directly with Toyota. They're directly uh, competing with Nissan, and they're coming up into the board, and they've got the cash flow to do it. Trust me. So they've upped their game, but their reputation isn't there. So you're getting more value for the money. So that's why they've got a little growth pattern going on now. Plus, resale and use, they still have the bad stigma of the older Kias. So their resale value isn't crap. So they're still trying to buy into the U.S. market. And they probably will for the next five or eight years. And um, that's just how it is. So there, there'll be room on Kias and Hondas for the next five or ten years to really make yourself some profit as you're rocking and rolling forward. Um, a car I would kind of – which. Let me, you know, back in the day when I first started out, they had Suzuki was offered as a um, as a little car. Now, this little car had no resale value, but it was a great car. So if I was driving a car, I'd love the little, little Suzuki Swifts and so forth and so on they had. They had the Swift, the Swift GT, and they were basically Geo Metros, and they were good cars, but they held no resale value. And th that's the problem you get with some of the lower-end imports, even though they might be good, reliable cars. 
they're still worth nothing even if you get a good deal on them. That's why you got a good deal on them because they ain't worth nothing to start with. There's there's no uh, perceived value at the end of the rainbow when you get it and you're trying to sell moving on because nobody wants a Kia Sophia. Nobody wants a Suzuki Swift. They want a Toyota Corolla or um, Hyundai's got some sexy cars out now. Um, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, some rust buckets for a second. So I'm telling you basically that I want cars in my market that are gas savers that can make the run. I can have college kids come in and out in my home. I can have single women come in by them. They can buy them with confidence. You know, these are buyers. I mean, straight out of the, that's the best customers you're going to get. So now let me move markets. Let me come up into the rust belt for a second. Let me come where cars are just thrown away. Literally. They don't care. Cause after five years, the, the under, uh, uh, it's just rusted out. The frames are gone. You know, and the rocker panels are ate up at, you know, there's 2010s that ain't got no rocker panels left on them. So if I was in that market, my whole game would change. I would not even be talking about gas saving or anything like that. That would turn around and be, I would be into the southern markets or western markets that don't have the rust issue, that's out of the rust belt, wherever I could find the cheapest market. And let me tell you what, I'd be trucking them in by 10, 10, 12 cars at a time, and I would be getting premium money on cheap cars for cash because this is what I would do. I would say, hey, look, now I'm going to give you a chance to own a car that you can drive for five years for three grand or four grand, and you're not going to find that anywhere around here because everything out here has already been inundated with rust. So all you're going to find is crap. My car is going to give you four years of service, and you're going to get premium money. You can come buy unrusted cars in the market for $1,200, take them to the rust market because there's no rust in the store. You got the wide open market. You can bring trucks, you can bring brick cars, you can bring uh, SUVs, the bigger SUVs, you can bring the subcompacts, you can rock it from top to bottom. It doesn't matter what you got. You can bring it in and you can swing and you can hit and you can bust ass all day long. So that's what I would do if I was in the rust market. Now you get into other markets like in Texas, I used to work for a place called West Loose Dodge. I had a little issue with a girlfriend. Yeah, I figure that car man and girls. Anyway, so anyway, she decided we we decided we wasn't in love anymore. So I was just kind of like down on my luck back in uh, I don't know, it seemed like around the late nineties. So I rolled into a place called West Loop Dodge. It was uh, a pretty cool place. It was kind of like the old West outside of Fort Worth. Anyway, um, so I go into West Loop Dodge, and long story short, it was a Hyundai dealership. I think. I think it was a Hyundai dealership. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, it had to be Hyundai, not Kia. So it was that and Dodge. And um, anyway, it's pretty cool. I mean, with that, I, I got a uh, my first car deal an hour into it. I sold a um, a conversion package on one of the big Dodge trucks. I made like a fourteen thousand dollar gross profit. The GM says, "I don't know where you come from. Go pick out whatever you want to drive, and I'll put dual exhaust on it." Cheers. So the car man was back in business. Anyway. Uh, so I get to sell, and a guy comes in one day. He says, hey, man, um, I'm looking for a new Hyundai. Crickets. Then I realized we do have a Hyundai sign out, but nobody knew where the hell the Hyundais were at. I said, man, where is the Hyundais at in here? And this is in Fort Worth. Guy's like, man, we got a storage lot down around the corner, back around the side, blah, blah. Anyway, this whole long, drawn-out process to go find this Hyundai. I said, man, all right, all right. So I get in the car, throw them in my demo, off we go. I find the place, and man, there is like, let's say this is 1999. There is like 1996 models, 97s, 98s, and they're all brand new. They all have sticker prices on them. These Texas dealers cared so little about the new Hyundais, they didn't even try to liquidate them. They just stuck them in the storage lot. I guess they kept it for the financing so they'd be able to sell their Dodges, but they didn't give a about them. I don't mean nothing. They just stuck them out there and let them rot which was hilarious. They were like inconvenience that you had to jumpstart the battery. I mean, that's just how people thought. So if I was in a market like Texas where trucks are so high and so much in demand, I wouldn't waste a whole lot of time in the other markets. Like I wouldn't get into the subcompacts and all that. I once again would switch markets from the truck market and I would come into like a commute market like where we're at right here. Or like if I was in Texas, I'd probably jump into Georgia because in Georgia, four-wheel drives work nothing. Nobody wants them. They don't want four-wheel drive SUVs. They don't want four-wheel drive trucks. Just a big waste of gas. They want a pretty truck, and that's all they want. 
So you can go there and you get rust-free vehicles that look better. They don't have any sun peel on them like you get in Texas. And I would buy 10 or 12 of those, ship their asses right back down to Fort Worth and put them for sale. I mean, that's that's how I would do that. Now, that's completely out of the market here. If I attempted that here, I could sell trucks with no problem. But there's a lot of competition on trucks because everybody knows that it snows somewhere between here and we're kind of starting to go up the East Coast. So my four wheel drives, they're always going to be worth a lot of money. That's just how it is. So it doesn't pay for me to be in the four wheel drive market because there's not a whole lot of room for me to play in it because people here know they're what they're worth and whatever. What people don't care around here is the low income cars. Like they, they care less. They'll throw a Cavalier away as soon as look at it. They'll throw, they'll throw any of these cars that are less than three grand. They throw them in the trash. They don't even want to look at them. Our junkyard is nicer than most used car lots. They, when you start getting further south or north, our, our junkyard is usually nicer than most car lots. And one day I'll shoot a video on how nice our junkyards are. I mean, they're really nice. They, they're jacked up, man. Most of the cars look great. <laughs> the paint looks good. The interior looks great. I mean, it's crazy. But people around here, they don't care. I mean, they're all, you know, the general, the average income is probably 100 grand plus in the county I'm in. And, um, or I know Hanover is like 120. You think they give a shit about a 100,000 mile car? They don't care. They're getting another one. And that's just a cycle. So you got to be in you, whatever place you live in is where you've got to be good at. You've got to own that position. You've got to own that market. And you got to be smarter than your competitors. You've got to be going for the blood. You you got to be going for the money every day, day in, day out, knowing what that's doing. And like, if you if you know that you need trucks and you're in Texas and your ass needs to figure it out, you need to get over here, over to Georgia, or you need to get over to Col no, Colorado. It's a bad place to buy trucks because they bring all the money over there too. All right, so you're pretty much stuck going from the to the south to the um, back to Texas if that's your case. In the Rust Belt, you need to come south into Virginia below, buy these mileage out cars, sit them back up there. If you're uh, in an emission state like California, then I would be concentrating on – California is a tough deal because they make it hard on everybody, man. They, they are just tough. Like we – I was telling a story a while back. Even as a Ford dealer, we couldn't ship cars there that weren't California certified. So, I mean, we're talking brand new cars from the factory. So, I mean, there's a lot of extras going on in California that it's hard to play with. But I guess in California, you're kind of stuck with the deal where you have to buy locally to make sure that you have a, or or maybe you could develop a competitive edge where you or you specialize in emissions so you know what's going on. Like you have a connection with the cat converters or whatever, like you start installing them or you have a guy, something like that, that gives you a competitive edge. But most times in markets, a competitive edge is moving next door. That's almost how you always win and beat it. Not to be getting off subject, but... All right. So, um, yeah. So, and, and, you know, if you get into specialized stuff, I'm just talking about right now, we're, we're generally talking about if you're just flipping cars every day, but if you specialize and you get into like a, uh, a niche market, like, uh, we'll give you an example. If you're just nothing but a sports car Corvette guy, everything on your lot is Corvette. Uh, one, I know of a guy right now I can think of, and his place is based off of being in Corvettes. Um, if you install a no carb cat, they throw you in jail. Really? Wow. Hmm. Wow. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. So I know California's nuts, man. Like you, you just got to watch. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Maybe y'all can get some changes out there or something. So you only make some boats, kick some people out on some emission stuff. <laughs> I don't even know if that's possible. I, I guess once it's voted in, it's done. But, um, so if you think about it, if, yeah, like a Big Cliff, he's in salt air. So, you know, Big Cliff's a little different story because he, if he was going to be in the car game, he would almost have to have a U.S. connection to be shipping them to Barbados. Like he'd have to be here and going through that. You know, he'd have to be that guy that was bringing them in or he'd just have to be like a repair shop there that was be able to make, you know, chicken soup out of chicken. You know what? Um and we, uh, yeah, so yeah, I hear you, brother. So anyway, long story short, that's how I handle, that's how I handle some of my favorite cars. But like I said, if you're a niche market, that's going to change because, you know, then all of a sudden you're on a worldwide stage. So if you're on a classic car or a specialized sports car or some type of specialized thing, 
then all of a sudden you're not counting on your local traffic. So you're going to have to eBay to sell your stuff. You're going to source out from eBay. You're going to buy cars on eBay. You're going to buy cars wherever you can find them actually. But when you go to sell them, you're bringing them back to a worldwide market instead of your local market. So as far as I'm concerned, that's a lonely world to be in. Um, I got a real close family a member that does nothing but classic cars. And he gets into the classic cars and he's actually got a 66 Malibu right now or something like that. But he's had it. He bought it cheap, you know, run it, run and drive and put a little cheap paint job on it. it makes He made it nice. But he, this guy's in this thing for six weeks. Then when he goes to sell it, he's sitting on it for another week or two, three weeks. And he's, you know, there's no way that you can produce a living doing that. Um, in a quick turn type operation, unless you have a very uh, diversified shop that's got a huge study or, or a huge ability to flip cars. You know, you got to have a guy that does rust and body. You got to have a guy that does machine work. You got to have a guy, you got to have a guy for everything when you get into classic cars and you have to have the sources, and, you know, on and on and on and on it goes. So you take that job and then you, you turn around and hand me a Chevy Cavalier that I can go to any junkyard and I can replace any part for 40 bucks and be done in an hour and I have a car that'll make $1,500 in less than three hours. I got to stay with what sells. I mean, that's how you keep the money flowing. So, and another rule of thumb I look at is how long does it take to turn a car? That's how I decide what my favorite cars are because I'm all about money because there's a woman in my life that costs a lot of money. Don't ever say I said that. Um, so yeah, so they do cost some money. Life costs money. So you got to have money to flip cars. You got to have money to live. You got to have money for everything. So to me, it's time on turn. So I know that if I have a subcompact, somebody's going to want to buy it immediately because everybody's in a transportation. They're called transportation cars. If you can get a transportation car that's ready to go, then boom, you got money. Into, I call it instant. That's your ATM. If I went into like... Let's say tomorrow I went and bought five Cadillacs and I bought all five Cadillacs for a great deal. I may be sitting on them Cadillacs for a month, month and a half because I have to find somebody that wants A, a big giant boat, B, a big giant boat that costs a lot of money to fix after 100,000 miles, C, it's heavy on insurance. Everything on it's a negative, even though it's transportation and even though it's a pretty car, too many people don't want them. It's too much of a negative. It's too much of a hill to climb, and you just need to run away from it. Now, if I was known for specializing in those cars, and that's all I had, and people knew me for it, and that's what I, they came to me for, that's another story. But most likely, that's not going to be the case because there's five Cadillacs on every corner you look at of people with old, dead, beat-down Cadillacs, and nobody wants anymore, and there's the junkyards full of them. So to me, it doesn't make sense to get into something out of market and out of source. Now, there is cars that kind of meet the middle that don't flip real fast, but they're not too bad of a turner either. And I'll give you some of the bigger model GMs, like the Grand Prix. The Grand Prix is a great car to get in um, as far as like as far as the flip and turn situation. So you get into a Grand Prix, you can get into them cheap. The turnaround time is fairly quick. They're pretty nice cars. They got sunroof, leather. You know, they're pretty loaded up and they got a little bit of sports appeal, but they are a little bigger than, say, the Grand Prix. Gas mileage isn't great. But somebody's going to buy it. Are they going to buy it in 24 hours? Uh, I don't know. Will they buy it in less than seven days? Yes. So I will buy Grand Prix because I know that there's a paycheck that's pretty quick on it. Um, but then there's other cars that aren't as hot that are as big. Like you get into the Buick Sabres. Buick Sabre, what a dynamite car. That is an amazing car. It drives great. It's like riding on air. I don't think anybody can say much negative about um about the Buicks. But guess what? Nobody wants them. Nobody wants a Buick. They just don't want an old Zolero. They just don't want them. You can sell them if you do them cheap enough and they make them super nice, but they're not a very desirable car. So they wouldn't be on my list, even though both of those cars drive great. You have great reliability. You got no problem with them, but they're just not popular. So that's just how it is. All right. Well, enough of me talking. What you guys got going over here? California's like doing business in North Korea. <laughs> Okay, guys, I was not expecting that. Um, so, yeah, I can imagine doing business in North Korea, especially what I see on TV. It doesn't look like a very uh, hospitable place for a used car lot. I'm just guessing. I don't know. I've never been to North Korea. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't think the little uh, the little rocket dude, I don't think he's into uh, V8 power. Just throwing that out there. Um, 
BJ and other cars, speed limit is 80. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, and I can see that bringing in some national, uh, some of your nationals bringing in some American cars, and I imagine they do really well in the islands. See, this is a great play. This is what I love about my channel. See, if any of you guys out here wanted to, um, like, network, we see Big Cliff, he's sitting there saying that, you know, it's kind of, but a Big Cliff is there. That's half the battle. If you want to get into a market, you've got to have somebody in there. Um, how about in rental situation, cheap weekly rentals for the lower income market? Okay, perfect. Perfect question. See, we're, we're changing market strategies again. I love it. Everything's about layering income, and I'm going to get into that. You know what? Tomorrow we're going to do layering income because it's an important situation. Um, so I do believe that the lower rentals, this is where you got to think smart. Now, this all comes down to maintenance because we know we're going to have blown head gaskets and busted brakes. So, I mean, that's just how it goes. Uh, somebody's going to be knocking fenders off. All this crap is going to be happening to your car as you're making 50 bucks a week or 100 bucks or 80 bucks a week. And I'm talking about instead of lot financing it, actually renting it to that same customer and just letting him pay a weekly payment. But you own the car. I think we're on the same page there. Um, so, yeah. So this is where you've got to be real specific. The big luxury cars are definitely out. We do not play with big luxury cars. We're going to go with common um, big three cars like the little Chryslers and um, the Chrysler four cylinders. Don't stay away from that two seven, but that little four cylinder, you can't beat it. You can buy a cheap one. You can buy one of those and throw it in there for 300 bucks. Um, um, and Eric Breckner Basin was car supply. <laughs> Hope you are reading the thing. Um, yeah, so I like I like the lower market rentals, but I would definitely get into I would get into cheap big three American throwaway cars and maybe some of the big uh, one of the big three import ones that any car that's readily available in the junkyard is what you want for a rental car. You don't want a car that's like rare, 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 period. You want it as common as humanly possible with a little bit of eyeball. If you got to. Buy the ugliest car you can find, I mean, with the paint baked off of it, but let that sucker have low miles and run perfect. Take it down to Mako because the guy wants it's desperate for a car, and he's going to step up to the plate and be like, thank you for giving me transportation so I can feed my family. So, yeah, family sedans, the cheapest ones in the market, the most reliable. They are built. Yes, 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 auto buff, definitely. Four-door sedans is a way to go in that lower rental market. Um, and I'm going to tell you this. I'm thinking about getting into that lower rental market again um, and because, well, the wife is like really – she just isn't really keen on it because she doesn't want me to deal with the public anymore. But I, I really enjoyed it. I like messing with the cars. Maybe if I was 10 years younger. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, so the rental cars are definitely, uh, definitely a very viable source of income, and there's like a lot of headache that's not involved with everything else. Um, Big Cliff, 20. <laughs> Family sedans, I got you. All right. Um, so uh, I, Chrysler's probably your cheapest of the big three, like the Sebring and the Stratus. You can put them out all day and all night long with no problem. I mean, you are gonna have you're gonna have a serious demand and you're not gonna be able to keep them in the house. And you're never gonna have five or seven hundred dollars in them. And usually within 30 to 60 days of renting them out, you're just making profit. So that's how I would do it. You could up your game into the GM, like um, like the the little Grand Ams. I think they made them all the way up through whatever year. But the later model ones are awesome. They make good money. And like the Grand Prix would work on those too. Any of that stuff works. The little cheap stuff that's just dime a dozen. Perfect, perfect, perfect. The um, I had this girl. She had a uh, 2004 Grand Am. I was like, how much is your payment? She's like, oh, it was like $400 a month. And she's like, I couldn't get a car anywhere, so this is what they did. And I said, have you ever – and I was talking about something else. She goes, no, I got to make my car payment. I said, do you mean they won't give you an hour flexibility on it? She's like, no, and they certainly wouldn't. They had the keys shut off, and you had to put a code in whenever your payment was due. And without that code, the car wouldn't start. And it what it does, it retrains the buyer to make you a priority instead of second or third in line. You become the first in line, then the power bill – and whoever else and getting your nails did and all that stuff is like five, six, seven, eight. But paying the car note becomes the primary because they don't have an option. So it's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, definitely the tax write-offs are definitely for you on rental. I mean, the tax, the tax code is going to work for you in anything rental car-wise.
period. You're going to, you're going to love that. And then after you get done with it, cause you know, most people drive it for three or four months, get a little relationship with them. You're like, Hey, you know what? I'll put you in a little nicer car. And eventually you retire the car out of your fleet. And since you only had five or seven hundred dollars in it, I mean, you, you just blow it right back out for five or seven hundred dollars and pfft, done. I mean, you, you never you never invested nothing other than time and maintenance. So it's a great deal. Um, I'm a little more leery about tote the note cars because you have to get into things like um, how the repossession works and then retitling the cars and then the repossessions. And I mean, it's just a lot of BS involved. It can be extremely lucrative, but to me, it's cleaner to do the rental thing. That's just how I feel about it. I mean, but if you're into the, you know, if you want to do the secondary thing and you got a great way to uh, collect your money, then rock and roll. The key to that is just training them to know that they have to prioritize your payment because you're dealing with people that aren't specifically known for paying their payments. So, you know, that they're not going to be on time, unfortunately. So you have to if you are if you're good at retraining people how to repay, then you're going to be perfect at it. If you're not good at getting collections or uh, you don't have a system that'll guarantee you that, don't even try it. You'll go out of business quick. All right, guys. Um, anything else? Because it uh, looks like I kind of ran up the time again. Uh, I was going to shoot it for about 20 minutes. We're now on the 42-minute mark. <sighs> Sorry. Didn't mean to talk your ears off. Um, but I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to share that with you. I mean, the guy's uh, he's struggling. I just wanted to share it with you, get it out there on how I – how I look at it and maybe, you know, maybe y'all can use that information in your, uh, you know, in your own personal needs or goods or whatever you can do to help you with your families. But my top three is Toyota. I'm going Toyota and I'm going small GM. Um, Chrysler is a distant third. Uh, actually I'm not even putting Chrysler on my favorite. I will sell them, but they're not my favorite. I'm going Toyota. The, uh, GM is very popular and SUV and small compact. And then Subaru is always a great car, only if it's running. And then uh, Hondas are great little flip cars because they have, they're a better value than they're perceived. So you can buy them cheaper than they're actually worth. And the late model Kias aren't bad either. So I'm going to go with those two. I mean, um, and like I said, Nissan, running Nissan, can't beat them, you know. But I guess that's how it goes. And Honda. So Honda had this period of life back in 2000 where they really had some issues with their transmissions. So that being said, as long as we've got a good transmission in a Honda, I'm okay with it. Um, but Hondas were one of those cars, too, that bring premium money. So it's hard to buy them cheap. Therefore, I don't really run across them that much. But I do occasionally run across them. But they're usually not great deals. This depends on who you got. All right, guys. Well, look, man, I hope you guys have a wonderful, fabulous Tuesday. Tomorrow I will be uh, at 5 o'clock. At 5 o'clock, the car man will be talking. And you know what? I'm going to tell you, we're going to be talking about layers of income because I think that's important, especially if you're going to come out here in this world and you're going to try to survive, learn from a few of my mistakes, and get you some layers of income going. And you already know right off the bat, I'm going to be talking about uh, rental income. I'm going to be talking about a uh, lot financing. I'm going to be talking about uh, financing cars and how you make money on them as far as the products, like the licensing products, like uh, insurance and gap insurance and all those little things. And then there's other things like services you can provide. There's all kinds of little layers that you can add to because the car business can be a very lonely place if you do not have layers of income and you're just waiting on the next up to walk on a car lot. But that's just between you and I. Uh, all right, guys. So peace out. Nothing but love and five o'clock tomorrow, man. We'll see you on the flip. I'm out of here, baby.